Hey, John Harris here with the Rock Metal Podcast. Join me as we get to go behind the scenes into what goes into producing records and making music as we interview some of our favorite and soon-to-be favorite bands. And today we're chatting with Devin Townsend about his new record, Lightwork, and the Dream Sonic Tour 2023 with Animals as Leaders in Dream Theater. Lightwork was produced with Garth Richardson, which we're going to chat about, and we're also going to chat about the Deets, the lowdown on the Dream Sonic Tour, and so much more. So please stay tuned to the very end. But first, let's check in with our beautiful sponsors. Asher Media Relations, doing public relations for everything loud. For your band needs to be seen and heard in print, online, and radio, head over to ashermediarelations.com. That's ashermediarelations.com. Mention the Rock Metal Podcast and get your band noticed. Syndicall Music is a full-service agency for musicians offering record label services, marketing, branding, production, and management. Head over to syndicallmusic.com. That's syndicallmusic.com. S-Y-N-D-I-C-O-L music.com. Mention the Rock Metal Podcast and take your music career to the next level. All right, Devin, thank you so much for coming on today to the podcast. Go and say hi to all of our beautiful listeners. Hi, all you beautiful listeners. Looks like you're in home base right now, which is absolutely fantastic. You mentioned you're working on some stuff, uh, especially before the tour. We're talking about the Dream Sonic 2023 Dream Theater Presents. It's going to be the inaugural show. We're going to be chatting about that towards the end of the interview. But right now, let's go ahead and get on to Lightwork, which is your latest mm. record. If you're released mm -hmm. November yep. 4th. I read a lot of really good stuff um, with regard to this record, and I listened to the record, and... I mean, obviously, all of your stuff is great, but this is probably one of my most favorite thus far. And mm. kind of, I think you mentioned as well, it sort of seems pulled back a little bit, just kind of calming, but it's it's incredible in the way it sounds epic in its restraint, I guess you mm. could say. It was an interesting one for me because there was there were several projects that, that had happened during the course of the pandemic that were completely out of left field for me, unexpected as the pandemic was, I guess. So there was the puzzle, which is the first thing that I did. And then that got followed by light work. And as is typical with, with the material, if I do something really complicated, inevitably the next project is going to be much more simple. And then if I do something simple, inevitably the next one will be more complicated. If I do one quiet, next one will be loud, blah, 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 blah. blah. So puzzle was a reaction to, to the beginning of the pandemic. And it was, it's, basically a, a very a very complicated and chaotic uh, project and so when it came time to to deliver the next record because puzzle had been independent and I'm with Sony the only thing that seemed appropriate for me was something that was more pulled back something that was more um, linear and I had been looking for an opportunity to work with Garth Richardson who'd been a friend of mine for many years and because he is a, a producer that has a long history of making things that are more accessible in a sense, um, it was an opportunity for us to try it out. And Lightwork became an experiment in several things, in trying to see what it would be like to work with somebody else in a co-production capacity, what it would be like to write something that was a lot more linear, but also, and almost most importantly, how could I create something that for me, uh, had a sense of, of optimism to it in a period that was so rife with the opposite, right? And I think the record worked out well, but I'm looking forward to the next thing, which, going back to what I said a second ago, is going to be significantly more complex as a result. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you mentioned working with Garth Richardson, so we'll chat about that a little bit later. We'll touch base on on that. But I was curious, with regard to light work specifically, what was the greatest moment for you producing the record? Well, again, I, I produced it with Garth, and it was um, complicated in that sense because I've never done that before. So it forced me to to contend with with things that I that I was ill prepared for. But I think on a production level, the thing about light work that was uh, maybe the most proudest but also the most complicated was just forcing myself to listen to somebody else you know and i think that that was really something that that uh was incredibly difficult for me and i don't know if i'll repeat to be honest but um but what comes 
from that is a type of self-analysis on your own process that I think unless challenged will just continue going in the ways that it has gone for many years. And so I appreciate being challenged by that. Regardless of how the record ended up, the whole idea of being forced to fight for your ideas, I guess, in a sense, was uh, simultaneously good for my personal growth, but also very difficult at the time, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Would you say that working with Garth was one of the more challenging things on the record, or what was the biggest challenge? Oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't that it was working with Garth, because Garth's an incredibly talented, and he's a good guy. I've tried working with producers in the past, and I, I do, I, I hate it. Like, I respond really poorly to it. And so I think there's a certain amount of that that, that was consistent. Like, I think that still carried through. But um, fortunately, uh, we'd known each other prior. So although it was difficult for both of us, I think we managed to get through it in a way that was uh, as best as could be expected, right? But no, he's a super talented guy, man. Great guy. Yeah, yeah. What went into the decision to work with the producer on this record? You mentioned you've known Garth before, but yeah, you know, a challenge to work with a producer. So what went into the decision to work with one? That well, it's been brandy to boat for many years by label, by management. Like, like you should try to see simply just to see what happens, putting your your ideas through the filter of somebody else. And that was, you know, I attempted to do it with a couple other people, but I just, I didn't. I guess I didn't respect them in the ways that I I needed to in order to listen. You know, um, my only other time that I had worked with somebody in a co-production uh, capacity, but less so than with Lightwork, was with Mike Keneally with Empath. But that was a little different because Mike plays in the band with me now, and and he's much more of a sounding board where he just sort of sit back there and and then I could bounce things off him, and it became a much more uh, uh, creative endeavor, and it, it basically just Gave me another brain in the room, which was ideal in a lot of ways. But Garth uh, got a, a long career of doing things a certain way. And so putting my work through that filter, who knows what it was going to yield. So I think that it's almost light work acted as, a, as an opportunity for me just to find out what something like that would yield. And again, I'm, I'm proud of the record. I think it's really cool. But it also made me realize as soon as it was done that the next thing I'm going to do is going to be completely uncompromised because having people talented as they are say, oh, I don't like that. No to that. Oh, I don't like that. No to that. Yes, that, but more of that, double the chorus, whatever. There was a lot of times I didn't agree. So we would have to kind of find a, a compromise. But I found that a lot of my personal energy went into that part of the process rather than just creating and that would have been the same with with any producer of Garth's caliber. It's not uh, a situation where it's him. But it was good for me to know because when it was done, I was like, I, you know what, I I'm happy with how it how that turned out. But uh, but the next thing I do, I want to spend several years writing it and recording it. I want it to be completely uncompromised, and I don't want any of these parameters at all. Right? I did learn a lot though, so some of those will certainly go into the next thing, but. I needed to know. I think that's the long answer to your question. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned you learned a lot. Was there something in particular that you took away that blew your mind? No, I don't know if anything blew my mind. But I think if there's anything I took away from it is the energy that goes into the social aspect of music. Unless I'm careful and I strategically set up my world with people whom the interactions with are effortless, then a significant amount of energy that could potentially have gone into other things goes into navigating the personal side of it. And again, this is not a scenario where it's about Garth or anybody, man, I'm, I'm not an easy guy to hang with. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm idiosyncratic and highly sensitive and you know i can be in my mind i make a lot of sense but to the people whom i'm closest to a lot of people don't think i make any sense so i have to surround myself with people that are tolerant to a degree of who i am 
as long as that comes with a certain amount of accountability on my part where I'm not just utilizing that as an excuse to be an asshole to somebody. But it's like if I surround myself with people like, yeah, that's Dev. That's what Dev does. That's where he's at. I'm cool with it. Then I don't have to spend any energy having to rationalize that. Right. And I think that for somebody who is as closely connected to music as I am and someone who is as sensitive to personal energy man what blew my mind about the process is how much of my energy went into navigating the social aspect of it which good to know don't want to do it again you know <laughs> yeah no that makes sense totally yeah that makes sense and i read a lot about the themes on the record and we kind of touched a little bit based on that going back into being sensitive to personal energy and kind of the way things went over the last couple of years mm. uh, needed to be calmed down. But obviously I could read all the, all the quotes that have already happened in the past, but I've got you here right now, Devin. So what's sure. what went into the themes on this record? Well, because it was, because as I just expressed the navigation of the social energies that come with working with a team of engineers or producers or whatever, took so much effort. I also moved twice, moved house twice and renovated during this. And the sheer amount of stress, throw the pandemic on top of that and all these things that went into it. And the fact that I had to move, it wasn't a scenario where it was flippant. You know, I was like, oh, I have to move now. Delightful. The combination of all those things created such pandemonium in my life and then also the social things that are happening with the record and little things like we were recording and a tree fell on the studio and knocked all the power out and I was having to edit things by candlelight it was and, and it wasn't like a, there's no romance to that I was just like I don't want to be doing this right now I don't want to be editing by candlelight i'd like to be at home just getting some sleep because this has been too much and because that intensity you know people in my life were passing away or like going fucking bananas or whatever it was i get so focused on the work no matter what i'm doing that if the material that i was working on compounded that existing stress it would have been just too much so I utilized the process of, of writing for light work to make something that was a bomb for that in some in some way. Like, what could I write? What could I articulate lyrically that when I'm having to focus on the music for hours and hours at a time doesn't compound this chaos? So I brought it back down to something more linear, which is why I asked Garth to be involved in many ways but also kept the the subject matter to be not that of optimism but but something that that acted as a tether for me that during those moments of chaos i could say well you know you just got to hang on man you got to hang on to this because above and beyond all this chaos that's going on you're still you still have a uh, have the faculties in your body you can still walk you can still you know you're you're fortunate to have these people in your life that are still alive and you're fortunate to have these friends that have got your back. You, you're fortunate to have a roof over your head or, or what have you. And so the lighthouse theme became prevalent on, on light work. And that was the, that was the album cover. And, and it was really a conscious decision to make something that was optimistic in that sense during a period of such relentless um, opposition to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't easy, man. It wasn't easy. But it's funny because now on the other side of it, I realize what I need to do next creatively. And um, yeah, it's it's going to be pretty uncompromising, man. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that a couple of times now. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, I'm still working through it. So I kind of my process regrettably involves me having to talk about it constantly so I can figure it out. So <laughs> I apologize for I apologize for that. No worries. They're my good man. More to come, but let's go ahead and check in with our beautiful sponsors. 
Two Madsen is responsible for producing, mixing, and mastering some of the best metal for over the last 20 years. From Meshuggah to The Haunted to Poison Black, Kipper Profiler packs for guitar players, and Easy Drummer expansion packs for programming drums. Two Madsen can take your production to a level previously unheard. Head over to twomadsen.com. That's twomadsen.com. T-U-E-M-A-D-S-E-N. Click contact, fill out the info for your next project, and let Two know that the Rock Metal Podcast sent you. Wormhole Death is a modern record label publishing and film production company born in 2008. Getting signed to this label means global distribution, publishing, and marketing with Wormhole Death's roster of global partnerships. Head over to wormholedeath.com. That's wormholedeath.com. Submit your band and let them know the Rock Metal Podcast sent you. How would you define success at this stage of, of your career? Who's success for me is waking up in the morning and not having to do anything. So I can spend my day doing whatever I want. And that could involve mowing the lawn or making food or making music or whatever. It's like, that's true success. I can participate in that once in a while, but I'm still working towards that goal. If you know what I mean? I'm sure you do. <laughs> but uh, on, a, on a practical level, I, I think I've been successful to a, a good degree because autonomous and I can do basically whatever I want musically within certain guidelines, right? There's a certain amount of tolerance that I still have to have on the part of the label and the management, but it's pretty good though, man. But moving forward, the goal is, is what I just mentioned to be able to wake up in the morning and do whatever I want with no obligations, mm -hmm. right? Who knows if that'll happen, but that's true success, I think. <laughs> there we go, baby. There we go. Let's go ahead and switch over to Dream Sonic 2023. And I'll open up with the first question, which is this is supposed to be the inaugural event. Dream Theater wants to create this yearly thing. How did this happen? How did you get involved? Well, it's interesting because I think that the, the, the audiences that Dream Theater and I have had, there's been some degree of crossover, but I think they're quite different. And I think a lot of that has to do with Dream Theater is such a technically proficient band and intellectually on a musical level, it's very astute. And a lot of what I do, it tends to be a lot more primal in a sense. Uh, not that there isn't technique to what I do, because obviously there is, but it's not learned. You know, I'm not theoretically knowledgeable when it comes to music or what I'm doing. And I'm in a, I'm in a different tuning and I, I didn't study it. I just have been doing it based on an emotional reaction for so many years that for many years, it was almost like the scenes or the audiences were, were mutually exclusive. I really appreciate dream theater, but I never listened to them. They were not a band that I had in my, in my, um, in my past as being like a, like an influence. So, I didn't really think about it and I had known Mike Portnoy, but, but I didn't really know the other guys. And, um, I did John Petrucci's guitar camp in New York a couple of years back. And I was surprised to, to, um, find out how easy of a hang he was. I was, I was maybe under the assumption that because of the music, maybe he would be more less apt to want to spend time with people or uh, very particular because the music is so particular but no john was a great guy man and i was i enjoyed hanging with him and i think maybe in in return perhaps he had you know because he'd known steve i or he'd known people who had known me and maybe he thought i was less um together as a person maybe he thought i was a banana or something and so when we spent time we were both like oh it's all right actually it's pretty easy and so it came up as an opportunity to tour together because we're both on the same label with Inside Out. And I think Thomas at Inside Out had told us both. It's it's like, oh, you know, actually, they're really cool guys. And actually, Deb's a, a pretty normal cat, regardless of what his music comes along as. And so we did, gosh, like seven weeks in Europe last year. And it was just Dream Theater and me. And I think Dream Theater, because they've been doing this for so long, they don't really have patience for taking out people who are or divas or or and so they took a a risk that me and my world would be pretty easy. And I think they were really appreciative of how easy of a band 
we are to tour with or i am to tour with you know because the band changes but like dude i don't want any drama i don't want to step on people's toes i don't need a lot of stuff on a on a, a list that i need to be provided for for the sake of my work i mean dude i just need some water and i need enough money to make it happen and we'll stay out of your way and there you go and i think they were really appreciative of that and then by the end of it we ended up hanging out quite a bit and then i spent a bunch of time with them we went to turkey together and they you know i rode with them and and did an acoustic show and i think we were both just kind of surprised that although the scenes of color kind of always been separate they actually mixed really well on a social level so when they came to do this they asked me again and i think it was really a scenario where they're like oh god we're gonna have to go out with bands that wasn't dramatic so that works good for us and so i said yes and then they had animals as leaders uh come out as well and uh, uh i've toured with animals many times and and get along with them so i think it's going to be a great run and it often it offers something for the prog fans that are three very distinct vibes right yeah, totally. Speaking of three different distinct vibes and maybe some audience crossover or maybe some not some crossover, either way, creating the set list can sometimes be a bit daunting. What should we expect from the set list for this show? I don't know yet. I figure that next week early I'll start thinking about it. Um, it's the same band as I had just done the headline runs in, in Europe with. So Mike Keneally, uh, Darby on drums, James on bass, same sound man who was great. And I think that um, there was a lot of things that we did on that headline run that were kind of unique. I had not done it before. So there'll be definitely some crossover because I haven't played in North America for so long that it probably makes sense to do some of those same things. But it's a shorter set than it was as a headline run, obviously. So by mid next week, I'll have a much better idea. Okay. Very cool. Kind of a silly question. Maybe not. How are you feeling about playing in North America? I know you mentioned it's been a, a little bit, but how are you feeling about the tour, getting out there? I haven't thought about it yet. I mean, I'm from North America, so I'm well-versed in in what it is. I mean, I like touring Europe or Asia or, or what have you, just because it's more, you know, I'm not used to it as much. So it's it's got more of uh, a novel thing where you end up in a city that, has a new type of food or something. And I really enjoy that. And in North America, it's much less of that, right? Like some places you get a bunch of really novel experiences, but you know, a lot of, a lot of North America. I mean, I grew up here. I know exactly what it is. It's like, there's the store, there's the chain, there's the uh-huh. bus stops at Walmart or whatever. Right. And, uh, but on the other side of it, I've got so many friends in North America that it's 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 good to hook up with them as well. But I, you know what, man? It's like tours a tour in a lot of ways. Very cool. All right, what's the number one thing you would like people listening to the podcast to do? And that could be the the drop that you have to make from management or labels. That could be I don't know a spiritual message. It could be anything. Oh, um, worse shit has happened to better people. All right. There you go. That's, I didn't mean, that's not a drop from a label and it's not very spiritual, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. true. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not, I like my job. I love my job and I love to be able to continue. And I've got so many plans for the future, but I'm not fantastic at selling it. Right. So. Hey, hey. Well, like maybe that's kind of an interesting follow up question. You're not fantastic at selling it, but you have, the career that you have built up and obviously it's been you know long from steve Vai to strapping young lad all the way up to this moment now to a couple of appearances on uh nail the mix you know i think if i was better at selling it it would be much bigger than it is right but i also feel that i feel that the things that's important to me the thing that is most important to me about the output that i have is that it's authentic to the frame of mind that i was in when it was being written and so in a sense, you're just trying to document those those moments in your life. And if you do it accurately, then I think people tend to resonate with that because there's not a lot really of human emotions, right? You've got what 12 <laughs> <laughs> and then nuanced versions of each, but it's all pretty simple. So if I do it in a way that is important to me, first and foremost, the chances of other people being able to relate to it 
are reasonably high. So my objective has always been to to keep tabs on myself so that when I am writing, I'm able to call myself out to the extent that I'm able on my own BS as, as I'm as I'm writing it. And the end result of that I think is longevity because there's maybe a certain amount of of the industry that that still feels like the audience is stupid in a way that all you need to do is is uh pull on over on them and then you can sell records and maybe there's certain genres that are like that maybe there is you know maybe i wouldn't i wouldn't dare to make assumptions on which ones are but the one that i'm involved in at least anytime i do anything that kind of veering towards that they're like yeah you're full of shit we know <laughs> so i got to be careful and, and and that authenticity that gets imposed on the material i think is what has created a, a, a long career for me and i'm super grateful for it yeah absolutely all right well everybody go ahead and head over to the rockmetalpodcast.ca there you can find the show notes for today including transcript videos released for light work and links to connect with Devin, especially for that Dream Sonic Tour 2023. I'll be at the show in Edmonton, so feel free to just come by and say hi, because I would love to meet you, you beautiful listeners. And Devin, thank you so much for coming on to the Rock Metal Podcast today. You're so welcome, man. Thank you for the uh, support, and I uh, hope to see you on tour sometime. And that's it for this episode of the Rock Metal Podcast. Stay tuned, because next week we're going to be chatting with Mark Diaz and Marcus of the band Lamori. They sought after a heavier sound on their latest record, which we're going to chat about. And it includes some time they spent abroad working on the record in Italy and all the shenanigans they got into. Go ahead, hit subscribe in your podcast player, share it with your friends, and I'll see you next week.